In this video we'll be taking a look at the basic concepts of mixing in 5.1 and 7.1 surround sound in Pro Tools. As you can imagine this is a massive subject so the goal in this video is to cover the key concepts and to take a look at the things which you might find the most useful when working in surround. The points we'll be covering include the following. I've included approximate start times next to each of these subjects to allow you to more easily skip to a section of interest if required. I'm not going to waste time by reading this list out now, it's there purely for reference if you need it. Let's make a start then and talk briefly about what 5.1 and 7.1 surround sound actually is, starting with 5.1. 5.1 uses five full bandwidth channels with the speakers arranged as shown. This is actually the ITU recommended speaker layout. The channels are left, center, right, left surround and right surround. Ideally, all of the speakers should be positioned equidistant from the mixing position. The point one is a dedicated low frequency channel referred to as the LFE or low frequency effects. This can be thought of as a supplementary channel to which you can send signals which you feel would benefit from low frequency enhancement. In fact, Tomlinson Holman, the creator of THX and 5.1, has said that strictly speaking 5.1 should be called 5.005 to indicate the bandwidth of the LFE channel in relation to the other channels. It's actually about 1 200th of the bandwidth. 5.1 is probably a better name than 5.005 though. With 7.1 surround sound, the left and right surround speakers are moved more towards the side of the listener and we gain a couple of extra channels in the form of surround back left and right. At this point I should probably mention another 7.1 format which is no longer used. In 1993, Sony debuted the Sony Dynamic Digital Sound or SDDS system. This used five speakers across the front and two surround channels along with the subwoofer. Over 1400 films were mixed in this format, up until the final releases in 2007. SDDS was a 35mm sound format, which stored the audio in a data compressed format along both sides of the 35mm film strip. Of course now, with hardly any cinemas actually playing 35mm film prints, no new content is being created in this sound format. In fact, Sony discontinued the production of the encoders and decoders years ago. What's interesting though is that Pro Tools retains the option to mix for the SDDS 7.1 speaker layout. I think at this point we'll just have a quick overview of the Pro Tools surround panner. So here you can see two surround panners. On the left is the 5.1 panner and on the right is the 7.1 panner which gains a couple of things, namely the side percentage control and also an additional pair of surround speakers. If you want some in-depth information on the surround panner, take a look at my two-part video aptly named the Pro Tool Surround Panner. One other thing I'll mention here though is that these are both panners from Mono Signal. If you were to route a stereo track, such as this one, to a 5.1 output, let's just close that, you can see that all of the pan controls are duplicated because you can of course position either of the two left or right parts of a stereo signal anywhere within the 5.1 or 7.1 sound field. Just before we move on, I also want to mention very briefly the Dolby Atmos integration within Pro Tools. To do this, I just need to create uh, a bus here, which is going to be in 7.1.2 format. So that's 7.1 plus two height channels. I'll just call this Atmos, I think. Let me just route a mono track to it. There we go. If I can find it in this list. There you go. Okay, so this is the Dolby Atmos panner. As you can probably imagine, there's quite a lot to this, more than might even meet the eye here. One notable thing, of course, is that we now can not only pan stuff in 7.1, but we've also got this height capability, so you can pan stuff in that plane as well. Avid offers some additional software called the Dolby Atmos Production Suite, which adds a variety of Atmos-based tools. It's worth noting that for actual movie mixes in Dolby Atmos for cinema release, you'll still very much need a Dolby approved mix room and the hardware RMU, which is the rendering and mastering unit. But the software based production suite is great for pre-mixes. Unlike previous surround formats, which were entirely channel based, Dolby Atmos is one of a new breed of surround formats which can utilize object based audio in addition to a more conventional channel based bed. In short, audio objects include positional data in the form of X, Y and Z coordinates, or X, Y and Z, depending on where you're from, which indicate that particular sound element's position within the room. It's inherently scalable to different room sizes and numbers of speakers due to the fact that the audio objects 
aren't tied to any particular channels, but instead are mapped based on their positional coordinates. Dolby themselves actually offer a free online Atmos training course, so the best thing if you really want to learn all about Dolby Atmos is to take a look at that. Anyway, let's get back to 5.1. Here you can see an extremely simple session which is a recording of a live performance at Parr Street Studios in Liverpool. As you can see from the session, there are only a few tracks, however it could still work quite well in surround, as you'll see. Because the performance venue is also a studio, we were able to record the audio straight into Pro Tools. Let me just show you what we've got in here, there's actually video that goes with it. I'll just play you a few seconds of this. Up a box up a rex on the street Fighters like me like to mash up the beat But if I have a answer me call a duty I'll be quick to smash buddies with a cube 3D I'm on the canvas boy Okay, so the balance isn't really quite right at the moment But let's see what we can do with it Obviously, you'll be listening to this in stereo on YouTube I just want to point out this Here's my 5.1 master And uh, you can see here it's going out of analog one and two. This is purely because of the screen recording software I'm using for YouTube. So wherever you see this greater than symbol, that means that Pro Tools is automatically down mixing 5.1 or 7.1 into a smaller number of speaker channels, in this case, left and right for stereo. So a lot of the concepts are gonna be a little bit theoretical, but at least I can show you the principles of working in surround and things that you might consider when you're working on a very simple mix such as this. I might just actually start by muting most of these channels okay firstly we've got a vocal now this vocal actually sounds pretty good for an SM58 because it was recorded through um, a Neve 1073 preamp aside from maybe a few mic pops which you would probably expect in a live performance the quality of the recording is actually pretty good Iron, iron, perfect, yeah. I'm never gonna let go. Say I'm never gonna let go. Iron, iron, perfect. Da, 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 okay, da, so da, da. I, I kind of put a high pass filter and a tiny, tiny high end boost on that. And there's a bit of compression on it as well. Just play a bit of this again. I wait to unlock her body. Yeah. I wanna make her join my party. Party. Okay, so it's just kind of taking a little bit off. It's not really affecting it too much. Then we've also got this acoustic guitar, which was mic'd up. You'll see the microphone in one of the shots. When it cuts to the, there it is. See, there's a little mic there. Let's play a little bit of this. This is a tune. Oh. Maybe just hear this in solo. Right, adding that in with the vocal. Just stop that for a second. I'm just going to show you where these are panned to at the moment. So here's the um, surround panel for the vocal. Now this is panned centrally, but what you'll notice about this is the center percentage control here has been reduced slightly. If I had this on 100%, if we were listening to this through a 5.1 speaker system with left, center, and right at the front, when it's panned completely centrally, it would be isolated in just the center channel but i felt when i listened to this in surround that that sounded a little bit too separate from you know other things and it just sounded a bit too kind of isolated within the center of the mix so by dropping the center percentage control you can see as i do this this control here this representation here rather of the center channel actually becomes more and more faint until on zero it's gone zero would basically be centrally panned but a phantom image between the left and right in the same way that you would pan something normally in stereo centrally that's what that is basically so it's a balance between central stereo panning or center channel panning i'm just going to drop it to i don't know 60 odd percent then we'll add in the acoustic guitar and you can see with this acoustic guitar it's probably better if i just stop this so you can hear me with this acoustic guitar i've just pulled it into the room a little bit and I've panned it towards the left to try and go some way to representing the position of the actual guitarist, you know, on the stage. Coupled with that, there's something which you won't actually see the guy playing this because he's uh, he's kind of to the right of the stage, just out of shot of that particular camera, and he's playing a cajon. So, let's play this on its own. And what I might do with this one is I might reduce the center percentage to zero 
just so that it's uh it has a bit of a broader spread even though it's technically a mono thing pan centrally it can help to give the effect of it being a bit broader at the front and it can also help to separate it acoustically from some of the things such as the vocal which are you know central but with a higher center percentage control so let's just have that in <laughs> Okay, that's alright for now. There's barely anything else on this particular song. Whilst you can see there are other channels that have been recorded on this track, they're not actually in use. They're purely there just because, you know, they were used on earlier songs. The only other thing of note here, which is where this really comes into its own as a surround mix, is these room mics. Now again, these went through a Neve 1073, so they sound pretty good. These were actually a pair of PZM microphones, pressure zone microphones, and uh, that type of microphone gives a half omni or hemispherical pickup pattern, and it's basically a microphone mounted on a flat plate. And in this case, I actually mounted them on top of two very high mic stands, probably nine or 10 feet up, pointing towards the ceiling, so they're mainly just getting reflected sound. So it's quite an ambient kind of recording. If I just play you this, there we go. You might notice there's quite a bit of um, bottom end coming from that cajon on these mics. I might filter that out. I've already done this actually. Just activate this plugin. You can see uh, it's a high pass filter at 50 hertz. So it's just cutting out those low frequencies because we're going to send stuff to the sub ourselves through selective use of the LFE send control that's coming up shortly. Let me just drop the level of this. You notice I'm doing a lot of this from the edit window, or pretty much all of it so far from the edit window, just because it's uh, easier visually to show you what's going on in the session without having to go to the mix window for this. Okay, so I'm just going to play this and gradually introduce the room mics, and I'll maybe just go overboard so you can hear it. It's a very natural sounding reverb effect because there's no more natural than the actual room itself. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. Round two. Never in a princess peach dilemma I snapped your star off the sky to get her The bluebird's given her a mention Swear down she loves the attention So let's say that that's okay as a provisional level However, we want this to sound interesting in surround and we're trying in this case to create something which broadly represents the sound of what you would hear if you were actually there and for that reason I'm going to pan these towards the back Now I've tried this in surround and uh, if I pan them directly to the back once again, it sounds a little bit isolated. So I've got two options here. I could either pull it into the room a little bit more. If I just play this on its own, actually, let's take a look at the master. Right, here's the master fader. Left and right surround. You will see it, of course, only in those channels. But if I bring it into the room a bit, See, we've got a little bit of activity going on in the front channels. The other thing that I could do, and I'll tell you more about this later in the video, is I could reduce the divergence. So we've got these controls at the bottom. Broadly speaking, divergence, you can think of it as controlled spillage into adjacent speaker channels. If I wanted to spill this a bit more into the front speakers, I could reduce this one like this. You'll see it again on here. To the point where if it was zero, it would basically be equally, it would effectively be the same as panning it to there. So what I might do realistically is just reduce it a little bit. So I'm just trying to keep it broadly where it is, but spill it a bit more into the front just so it gels with the other elements of the mix a little bit better. Okay, the other thing is if I wanted to, if I felt that that wasn't quite enough and maybe I wanted, you know, more of a reverb, reverb on the vocal, I've got a reverb send here. I could increase this. The reason why these are greyed out, by the way, is because I've got this FMP or follow main panner button highlighted, which means that whatever I do with the main panner on the track, the reverb send will follow it like this. So it just means that it tracks the actual main panner of that particular track. Anyway, this is going to the 5.1 reverb, and I'm using the R2 from Exponential Audio. 
let me just play this and send some of this to it. So I'm just going to solo the vocal. I've already solo safe this by command clicking on the solo button. Let's just take a listen. Uh, here comes a new Let's try. Here we go. Come send some to it. Boy rooms, with the party in his hand, this last man standing. And then when it takes you, <laughs> I am the new challenger. And I am the new salute. Going Obviously, that's a bit of a talk. I might just send a little bit, see what that sounds like. Obviously, we're hearing it in a stereo down mix, but you might get some sense of the overall balance at least. Maybe I'll increase the vocal level slightly. Okay, he's a pretty good vocalist. This is a guy called Esco Williams, if you want to uh, look him up. You know, he's a really good singer, songwriter, and vocalist. Uh, as you saw there, We've got a decent spread of stuff across the surround channels. Of course, you would really need to hear this in surround, but this is, as I said, just to illustrate. So we've got his vocal nicely up front in the center, the guitar's off to the left, the kahan is central, but I've reduced the center percentage control. We've got those ambient mics, the PZMs, they're panned towards the back, and overall, when I've listened to this previously in surround, it does give quite a nice representation of how it might have sounded in the actual venue on the day. And there's actually one thing which I just forgot to do there, which is to add some of the Kahan into the sub. So let's just open up the panel for this. There we go. This is the LFE send control, which sends it selectively to the sub. So I'm just going to increase this a little bit. And just add a little bit. This just kind of adds some of it into the low frequency effects channel. So you've got something coming through the subwoofer. You'll see it on this sixth meter here. Here comes the new challenge. So that was an example of using surround sound to try and create quite a realistic representation of an event. However, in film sound, you'll more commonly be trying to create more of an exaggerated representation with hyper-real sound design, and quite often with more creative and dynamic use of panning where appropriate. One of the fun things I like to show people when I'm first demonstrating surround panning to them is just moving a helicopter around the room. If you happen to have an S6 control surface to hand, this is particularly easy thanks to the intuitive touch screen, which really speeds up the process of automating surround panning. Here's my helicopter sound then. It's a mono sound source, and I can of course root it out of the 5.1 output, as I've done here. This means that I'm then free to move it around however I choose. Of course, demonstrating this in stereo via YouTube doesn't give a particularly good idea of how this would actually sound, but at least I can show you the principle of it. Let me just show you this. In fact, I'm actually going to automate this. I'm just going to do this in maybe latch mode. And I'm going to automate this around the room, but deliberately keeping it to the absolute extremity. So basically, I'm going to go around in kind of a square pattern. And if you watch the master at this point, you'll see that as it moves, when it's in any particular speaker channel, it's completely isolated. So you'll only see the level on that particular output channel. I just crop this so that I know where I'm starting. Here we go. There's the left, just on the left. Traveling towards the back left. It's completely isolated. Across the back. It's coming out of both speakers. Then it's just in the back right. Blending across to the front. Back to the center channel. And if I can just go back in the opposite direction. You see the same kind of thing. So what was happening there was, uh, as I panned it, it kind of jumps to each speaker, which for a helicopter probably isn't ideal because it would sound more like a point source rather than something a lot broader, giving the impression that the sound source is small. That's great if you want to pan the sound of a fly around the room, but less good for a helicopter. So this is where the divergence controls come in. And you can see that we've got three controls here, front, rear, and front to rear. As I hinted at earlier, you can think of divergence as a form of selective spillage between speaker channels. The lower the divergence, the more the sound will spill into adjacent speakers, but the less apparent the panning will become, to the point where, on 
the panna will essentially do nothing at all in that particular plane. So generally speaking, if you want something to sound broader and spill more into the other speakers, reduce the divergence. To make it more isolated and sound smaller, go with higher values. Let's just set this back to 100. So that's no spillage. I'm just going to play a few more seconds of this. Once again, let me just put this into read mode. This will just play back what I've just done and you'll see the same kind of thing happening again. Jump into the speaker, it's very isolated. Goes to the back, completely isolated again. And it keeps on doing that. However, if I reduce the divergence here, so this is divergence across the front. So the more I drop this, the more it will spill into the front speakers, if it's if it's already at the front. Maybe I'll drop this to say, I don't know, about 50. This is at the rear. I'll set it to somewhere around the same value. And the front to rear. Now watch the same thing again. So I haven't changed the pan automation. All I've changed at this point is the divergence. The pan automation will remain the same, still at the extremities, but watch the meters now. You'll still see you know, a higher level in the speaker where it is, but a lot of spillage. When it's around 50%, it will be quite considerable, the amount of spillage between the channels. And as I mentioned, that will sound like it's a lot bigger, but it'll be less apparent where it's actually moving to, to the point where when everything's zero, that would be completely pointless because the panner will now essentially be defunct and it will just come out of all speakers at the same time, apart from the LFE at this point. See, so it's playing back out of everything. So you just gotta be selective, you know, in a music session, you might want to use this to help things uh, gel with the other instruments. So for example, if you were mixing maybe a guitar in a 5.1 music mix, you could potentially reduce the divergence a bit, make it spill more, give it a broader sound, and it could help to integrate that particular instrument into the mix with the other elements a little bit better. Let's talk a little bit now about the LFE channel. As I mentioned earlier, this is a dedicated low frequency effects channel which supplements the other full bandwidth channels. In contrast to the main channels, the LFE channels delivers only bass information below about 120 Hz, so has no direct effect on the perceived directionality of the reproduced soundtrack. Its purpose is to supplement the overall bass content of the program, or sometimes as well to ease the burden on the other channels. In a smaller sound system, you might only have one subwoofer, but for larger rooms, it's common to use two or even more subwoofers for the LFE channel. Because of the difficulties in actually demonstrating this over YouTube, I'll just give you a very quick overview of how this works in Pro Tools. Each surround panner has an LFE send control on it, as you can see here. It defaults when you first open it to minus infinity, and as you'd expect, you send signal to the LFE channel just by increasing this send. Let's take a listen to another sound, which is an explosion sound. Okay, this is stereo. Just gonna put this on its own track. Let's close all this. If I play this back at the moment, it's probably gonna be quite loud. Yeah, you can see we've got a clipping indication there. I might just turn this down and also just check that pre-fader metering is off, which it is. So now we'll see a reduced level on the meters. Play it one more time. Okay, and then if I open up the output for this, you can see we've got the option here of sending this to the subwoofer. So let me just play this. At the moment, it's just on the front channels. I suppose I could kind of pull it into the room a little bit. Of course, you'd want to do something a bit more interesting than this if you were actually working in surround. You would probably add a lot of different elements into the surround speakers to create a much more immersive sound. But just for quick illustration, I'll just pull this into the room. You'll see that we've got left and right and a little bit on the left and right surrounds. So you'll see four meters active here at the moment that. Number two is the center channel, nothing's on that. Six is the sub, the LFE channel, nothing's on that. But if I, I'll just play that again just so you can see that. If I increase the LFE send control, this is essentially sending some of that exact signal via the output that goes to the sub. There's quite a lot there. So that would be one way to add a quick enhancement to it. To be honest though, just sending a signal from a track using the LFE send control 
quite often isn't ideal because end users, particularly consumers, will often have base management running. And this is where base from the main channels gets redirected to the subwoofer in order to play back the lower frequencies which the main speakers aren't capable of reproducing. This means that in a great deal of consumer playback systems, the subwoofer actually serves a dual purpose, and you might even find this in some studios as well. It'll reproduce the LFE channel, but also the subwoofer will play back the lower frequencies from the other channels, the bass managed bass. Because of this, if you just send stuff to the sub with the LFE send control, some users may actually hear more low frequency content than you intend because some of it's effectively doubled up. So it's therefore a good idea to create content specifically for the LFE channel. For example, with an explosion like this, you might create supplementary sub bass content to emphasize the explosion and send that directly to the sub instead of using the LFE send. One thing about this Pro Tools LFE send control is that it's always post fader so you can't easily use it to send anything exclusively to the sub. By that I mean if the channel fader is down, okay, so let's keep this LFE level up, turn the channel fader down, and what you'll see is everything's cut, it doesn't go to the sub because this is down. Completely mute. Increase this, back again. There's no way, using this method, there's no way of sending it only to the subwoofer, so it's restricted in that sense. So to get around this, what I'm going to do in this case is actually get rid of that LFE send control. I'm going to create some content which is dedicated just to the LFE. And in order to do this, I'm just going to check that I've actually got this. I need a sub path in place. Here's my main 5.1 bus. Okay, you can see it's LCR, LS, RS, LFE. That's fine. But there are also sub paths here for each mono channel and some multi-channel ones as well. The one I'm interested in this case in is the 5.1 LFE. So it's a mono output that just goes to that. What that means is, if I created a mono track, just do that, I could create, I'll drop something onto it, let's just say one mono leg of this, I could route this to just the LFE. So that would now just go out of the subwoofer. But actually, before I do that, let me just do something a bit more interesting with this. Because I don't want it just to be, you know, the same thing, because that's not much achieve much different to just using the LFE send control. I'm going to manipulate this a little bit so it's something a bit different. Let me just try, let's play it on its own. First. There it is. So it's now just a mono version of that. I might try pitching it down a little bit. So let's use the Avid Pitch 2 plugin. Drop it down a little bit. That's a start. What you don't want to do is go too far because if you listen to this, if I go whole octave, it'll sound quite artifacty. It doesn't actually sound low, it just sounds bad. And if you go even lower, it's just not good. So you've got to be selective about the use of this. I'll, I'll take it down a little. Yeah. And then maybe what I'll do in addition to that is use a subharmonic generator. So the Avid Pro subharmonic is a pretty good one. And this lets you basically add in frequency content below the fundamental to really supplement those super low frequencies. You could, of course, do this entirely manually. Just for speed here, I might use one of the presets. So there's these mono ones for the LFE bus. Just cycle through these. Here's one of them, Earthquake. Difficult to appreciate without a subwoofer, of course. There's that. And then we've got the next one, which is Thumping Club. And then finally, thunder. Okay, let's say that was the one. Now what I'll do is root this back out of the LFE. Maybe just start with the level on this down. Take a look at what, what's going on in the master. Here's our explosion on its own, first of all. Then I can add this other one, the subharmonic, into the subwoofer. Just going out of the LFE, not with the send control. Let's try that. And of course, with an actual subwoofer, that could be quite effective. Of course, you'd have to listen to it and balance it correctly, but I'm just trying to illustrate a potential workflow and kind of methodology of working in 5.1 here. At this point, I think we should go into a little bit more detail about track routing for 5.1. 
One thing to note about this LFE Send control in Pro Tools, if I was using it, is that although your subwoofer may only be capable of reproducing frequencies up to around 120 Hz, at no point when you use this does Pro Tools actually filter the signal that's going to the LFE. It basically sends all frequencies. And to prove this, let's just ditch this subharmonic thing, send this to the sub again. I'm just going to bounce this to disk. Okay, here we go. So bounce this. And I'll call this uh, Explosion FX. Bounce that. And then I'll import that. Here it is, drop it into the clip list. I could have dropped it onto an empty space here actually and it would have created a 5.1 track like that. Maybe I'll just get that out of the way. Okay, so this will sound the same as what we just heard. Except here's thing, something of importance. Just in the clip list here, you can see these are the uh, constituent parts of it, all the different channels. Here's the LFE. If I drag this out onto a, a track of its own, there it is, and just play it out of not the subwoofer, but play it out of, say, you know, just the front channels, center channel effectively, you'll hear that it's not just bass, it's everything that's just been sent to it. It contains all frequencies which were present in the original signal. It's not just bass because no filtering has been applied. If you were only going to listen to the mix in the studio, this might be fine, but remember that a lot of consumers have that bass management switched in. So whilst you might have your studio subset to only go up to 120 hertz, some listeners might have this subset to deliver much higher frequencies as well, because they're not only using it for the LFE channel, but also to fill in the low frequencies which the main speakers can't handle. And I did a little bit of research into this just by looking at typical consumer systems. And in a lot of those systems, the subwoofer might be reproducing frequencies up to as high as 250 hertz. This would, of course, mean that they're going to hear stuff that you never intended to be heard from the LFE channel. So the solution to this is simple. Filter your LFE channel in Pro Tools. One simple plugin to do this is the LFE 360 plugin from Waves. So you can see this is something you can put on the master. And here it is. It's just a low pass filter but with a very steep roll off of 60 decibels per octave. When I'm working in 5.1 I have this on my main mix output to make sure I've got complete control over what goes to the LFE channel. There is another good reason why it's good practice to filter the LFE though. If your mix is going to be encoded to Dolby Digital, the sample rate of the LFE channel actually gets dropped all the way down to 240Hz. If you remember anything about Nyquist, you'll know that this means the maximum reproducible audio frequency is 120 hertz. The problem with this is, if you haven't pre-filtered the LFE to remove anything above that frequency, 120, you'll end up with alias frequencies due to the low sample rate's inability to properly represent anything above half the sample rate. Yet again, this is a whole topic in its own right, but just remember, if it's going to Dolby Digital, at some point, filter the LFE at 120 hertz. I should also mention that most Dolby Digital encoders, such as this one from Nayrink, do allow you to filter the LFE channel at the encoding stage if you haven't done so already. Finally for this video, let's take a look at what you would actually do when you were ready to bounce your finished surround mix. In post-production, it's common practice to do an internal layback within Pro Tools. This is where tracks are rooted so that the finished mix and also some stems such as DME, Dialogue Music and Effects, are recorded in real time onto a new track within the session. Whilst you can of course do an offline bounce to disc, usually a lot quicker than real time, the practice of actually recording or laying back the mix within the session is still very common and it allows for any final checks to be made to the mix at the time of layback, but also having the audio on the track means that if something does need to be changed once parts or all of the mix has been recorded to the print track, just the parts which have changed can easily be re-recorded using either destructive record or destructive punch. In these record modes, the new content essentially replaces what was previously there, taking up no additional disk space and being appended to the existing audio file. Let me just stop this for a second. So you can see I've been laying it back within the session. There's the 5.1 print, that's the whole mix, and here is a stereo down mix. I'll just tell you a little bit about how I've done that, actually. The um, down mix has been sent from the Submaster, I'll just tell you a little bit about the routing. In fact, it's probably easier to show you this in the mixer. Um, all of the tracks go down their own respective buses, so I've broken them into different parts. For example, we've got 
uh, dialogue goes down the dialogue bus, as you would expect. Sound effects go down an SFX or sound effects bus. Um, and then you've got Atmos. It's a fairly simplistic mix this in terms of, you know, for a film, it's it's pretty sparse. On the right-hand side of the mixer, these eventually find their way into their own respective auxiliaries. So music comes through here, sound effects, dialogue, Atmos. And in this particular project, they all then get blended together in the submaster. And here I've got a few different plugins, which, you know, just do some final processing. But also, from this submaster, which is basically the entire mix, we've got two sends. One goes to a 5.1 track called the 5.1 print. And the second goes to what was previously a 5.1 track, which is called Down Mix. Now, I say previously a 5.1 track. This is a 5.1 send. This was created as a 5.1 auxiliary, but I put the Down Mixer plugin on it. This takes that uh, 5.1 and it blends it down to stereo. And I've set some appropriate levels here for that. Notice how I've muted the LFE. Usually in stereo, if you're taking something that was previously 5.1 and there is a low frequency effects channel, there's not really a lot of room just to be adding in more low frequency content in stereo. So you have to either put it in at a very low level or I usually just ditch it in stereo. You can consider the LFE as just a supplementary channel, which is preferable to have if you're listening in 5.1. But if you don't have it in a down mix, then it probably isn't the absolute end of the world, but you will lose some of obviously the content that you've mixed into that channel. So that goes to there, then it becomes stereo. And I've done a few other things like I've compressed it because the stereo version is destined for online, whereas the 5.1 mix for this project is for cinema. So we've got the broader dynamic range in the cinema, more compressed for the uh, stereo version. Out of that, it goes to a stereo print track. So we've got this 5.1 print send goes straight to a record track. This down mix goes via this auxiliary, gets down mixed, compressed, finds its way to here. That's what I've just been recording. So if I did want to drop into these later, I could do this in a couple of different ways. One is destructive. I can put it into destructive record mode and then make the appropriate changes within the mix, then go back to here and start it rolling. And I just want to talk about one other thing actually, which I do here. Usually I'll pre-roll into this. If I just start recording now, it'll drop in there and it'll add it into the file. Except the thing is, if I've got any you know reverbs or compression acting, those will only actually activate at the time when I press play. And so they might not be fully, you know, active when I start recording if that makes sense. So to get those up and running I usually pre-roll just a couple of seconds so that any compressions doing what it's doing, it's at the gain reduction that it should be, the reverbs running, any delays and anything are also up and running. Then I can activate destructive record and punch in with the pre-roll and it'll start recording two seconds later like this. Okay, and I could keep that going. When I stop it, you'll see it doesn't create a new file. It will just appear as the same file. It'll even retain the same name. Like that, stereo print underscore zero one, it's still the same. The only other mode which um, I sometimes use in this scenario is destructive punch. I probably won't do this now, but in destructive punch mode, if I did try and record now, it'll probably tell me that I need to prepare yeah, one, of, one or more of your DPE, Destructive Punch Enable Tracks, is not prepared for Destructive Punch. This is a little bit of a strange mode, actually, uh, if you're not familiar with it. It seems strange at first, anyway. Uh, in order to actually punch in destructively, you have to have content already on the track. It can't just punch into silence. So, in other words, I could punch in to something, but I couldn't continue recording beyond the end of it. So... There's a few rules about destructive punch. Firstly, you have to have content there. Secondly, it also has to start at the zero sample in the session. So it would have to start at the very beginning of the session. So if I were to try and do this and uh, it prompts me to prepare it, clicking prepare would render a load of silence from the start of the session through this. That would actually be incorporated into it, so it'd be a file that just had that but was otherwise silent, and it would go up to a duration 
which is actually specified in preferences under the operation tab and you can see it's the destructive punch file length so you need to make sure this goes just slightly beyond the duration of your mix so 25 minutes is the default which would be fine if my mix was you know just under that for this film which is what is it like 18 minutes i'd have to set it to just just over that and then whenever i prepare those dpe tracks it would render a load of silence to cover the entire thing i'd end up with a big block like that which had that integrated into it from that point on i'd then be free to selectively punch in and out of it as i went so i could click the record button you notice how it's alternating between blue and red that means that um, it's something I can drop in and out of so in real time you can destructively drop into an existing recording on the track and it won't create a new file it will add it to that existing recording let me just switch back out of that again maybe deactivate record as an alternative to actually laying the mix back within the session if you were happy that everything was good and you didn't particularly need the mix down files to end up in the session you could do an offline bounce to disk and in Pro Tools HD now known as Pro Tools Ultimate you can actually bounce up to 16 different sources at once and these can be anything from mono upwards and of course all 16 of these can be done offline so it can be a very quick process to get the mix and various different variants and stems and so on all bounce to disk in one go well, that's it for this video. I hope you've learned something. It's very difficult, of course, to fully demonstrate 5.1 over YouTube. So really my intention and hope with this video is just to give you a bit of an overview of it and to give you some pointers so that when you are actually working in Pro Tools in Surround Sound, you know, you've got a little bit of guidance on it. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you again next time.